Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is our service for January 15th, 2023. This week, we are focusing on listening for God's leading, even in times where it seems that God's voice is nowhere to be heard. Join me in our responsive call to worship. The voice of God calls to us. Are you listening? Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. The hands of God beckon us. Are you paying attention? Show us, Lord, your servants are paying attention. The love of God asks us, are you ready to follow? Guide us, Lord, and we, your servants, will follow. Come, let us worship the God whose tenacious love never stops calling and beckoning and asking us to follow. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day Jesus set out to go into Galilee, and when he came upon Philip, he invited him to join them. Jesus, follow me. Narrator. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, came from a town called Bethsaida, and he decided to make the journey with him. Philip found Nathanael, a friend, and burst in with excitement. Philip, we've found the one. Moses wrote about him in the law. All the prophets spoke of the day when he would come, and now he's here. His name is Jesus, son of Joseph the carpenter, and he comes from Nazareth. Nathaniel, how can anything good come from a place like Nazareth? Philip, come with me and see for yourself. Narrator, as Philip and Nathaniel approached, Jesus saw Nathaniel and spoke to those standing around him. Jesus, Look closely, and you will see an Israelite who is a truth-teller. Nathaniel, How would you know this about me? We've never met. Jesus, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel, Teacher, you are the one, God's own son and Israel's king. Jesus, Nathaniel, if all it takes for you to believe is my telling you I saw you under the fig tree... Then what, will, what you will see later will astound you. I tell you the truth, before our journey is complete, you will see the heavens standing open while heavenly messengers ascend and descend, swirling around the Son of Man. Sewing together to confess our sin. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought to have not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. And now we confess our sins silently. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Narrator. The boy Samuel continued to serve the Eternal One under the guidance of Eli, in those days, messages from the Eternal were rare, and sacred dreams or visions were given to very few. Eli, who was very old, had become almost blind. He was lying in his room. It was late at night, but before dawn, as the lamp of God still burned. Samuel was resting in the house of the Eternal One, where the covenant chest of the true God was located, and he heard a voice, Eternal One, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, here I am. Narrator, Samuel, 
Samuel, running to Eli, said, Samuel, I heard you calling. Here I am. Eli, I did not call you, my son. Go back and lie down. Narrator, so Samuel went back to bed, but the Eternal called him again. Eternal one, Samuel. Narrator, Samuel, running to Eli, said, Samuel, I heard you calling. Here I am. Eli, no, I didn't call you, my son. Go back and lie down. I need my rest. Narrator, Samuel did not recognize the voice of the Eternal One, for the word of the Eternal had not been revealed to Samuel yet. So Samuel went back to his bed again, and the Eternal One called him a third time. And once again, Samuel ran to Eli and yelled, Samuel, I know you called me. I am here. Narrator, Eli, realizing the Lord was calling Samuel, said, Eli, go back and lie down, my son. If the voice calls you again, I want you to say, Speak, eternal one. Your servant is listening. Narrator, so Samuel went to his bed in his place and listened. Then the eternal one came into his presence as before. Eternal one, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel said, Speak, Eternal One. Your servant is listening. Eternal One, pay attention. I am about to do something so amazing in Israel that it will sting the ears of everyone who hears it. The day is coming when I will carry out the vow I made to Eli about his family, every word of it. I have told him that I will punish his house forever for the sins of his sons, bringing a curse on themselves that he knew about but did nothing to stop. So I vow that the sins of the house of Eli may never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. Narrator. After hearing this message, Samuel lay there until morning and then opened the doors of the Eternal One's house, but he was afraid to tell Eli what God had said to him. Eli. Samuel, my son? Samuel. Here I am. Eli. What was it he told you? Tell me everything. May the true God carry out his vengeance on you and worse if you hold anything back from me that he said to you. Narrator. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing. Eli. This message is truly from the Eternal One. Let him do what seems good to him. Narrator. As Samuel grew, the Eternal One guided him, and none of his words were lost on Samuel. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, Learned that Samuel was a prophet of the Eternal One, and that his words could be trusted. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Simeon and Anna. They had spent a lifetime listening, listening for the news that the Messiah had come, and it was a quiet life. But eventually, the baby Jesus was brought into the temple and they were ready to sing their songs of prophecy after all those years of waiting and listening. And then last week, we talked about John and Jesus' baptism. John had spent a lifetime waiting and listening for the one greater than he who was coming. And after years of waiting and listening, the Son of God showed up at the Jordan River, asking John to baptize him. Today's readings move us to two other characters in the Bible, Samuel from our Hebrew scripture reading and Nathaniel from our gospel reading, Sam and Nathan. Simeon and Anna and John, they had all been listening and they knew just what they were listening for. But Sam and Nathan, they were listening, but they weren't sure what they were listening for. Okay, so here's a story which takes place during my time as an SBU student once again. I had lost my faith towards the end of high school and had come back to faith about halfway through my sophomore year of university. All of that is a story for another time. But even though I was newly back to faith, I was jaded. I was cynical towards Christianity. I believed in Jesus' words and what Jesus was all about, but I did not want to associate myself with what was called Christianity. In my mind, I considered myself you know, a follower of Christ, but not a Christian. And then, through various other stories that are for another time, I started to be interested in working as a linguist with Wycliffe Bible translators overseas, in missions. 
And if Christianity was still a bit of a dirty word for me, missionary was really a dirty word. And yet, if I continued on this path I was on, no matter how much I would tell myself I was a Christian linguist, supported by churches and individuals, it all still pretty much lined up as part of the world of missions, as being a missionary. And so there I was, a Christian who didn't want to associate with Christianity, and a soon-to-be missionary who didn't want anything to do with missions. <laughs> and I ended up taking a class about world missions, and I was jaded and cynical about the whole thing, and I was struggling with my identity within the context of Christianity and missions. And the professor, her name was Miriam Abney, she's actually a pretty prominent individual within mission circles, and her class was, it was a struggle for me because I wanted to be negative about so much, and yet I was also fascinated by what she would teach and the reality of Christianity and of missions, which was so much more, of so much more value than the narratives which I had played in my head. And I sat in the class each session, apparently with a scowl on my face, but underneath that cynical exterior, I was listening to every word, ready to challenge it and also ready to accept it. And long story short, I ended up working overseas as a Christian linguist and yes, as a missionary for the next 25 years. Miriam and I kept in touch over the years off and on. We were both connected to a church in the university district. I ran into her after we got back to the USA at one point, and she beamed at me and said, Brad, I tell a story about you still. You were always in my class just looking like you hated it, never talking, never making eye contact, never giving any positive feedback. I never in a million years would have thought you'd end up having the career admissions, which you did. <laughs> it's been an example to me that even when it seems like people aren't listening, they just might be. You never know who's actually listening. Samuel, from our Hebrew scripture reading, he was just a kid in the scene that we read earlier. He was a kid caught up in something way bigger than he was ready for. He was caught up in something which was shaping the life of all the people of God. But he didn't see that big picture. He was just a kid doing what he was told. He didn't yet even understand the meaning behind the daily duties he performed in the temple. It was his duty and he did it because he had to do it. There was no one else. His mentor, Eli, was getting old and going blind and couldn't perform all of his duties. Eli's sons were supposed to step in, but they had made a mess of things. So bad that faith in the priesthood as a whole was at a low ebb. But Samuel was there and he was just doing his job. A reading started by saying, In those days, messages from the eternal were rare, and sacred dreams or visions were given to very few. In other translations, this reads, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. It's a pretty rough start for a story which takes place in the temple of the Lord. And so Samuel's days were filled not with listening to the Lord, but with all the little details which Eli could no longer perform to keep the rituals ready for the people. And the people were in more need than ever because the word of the Lord was rare in those days. The people, they were trying to listen, but God was not speaking anymore, and they're getting increasingly directionless. Some start looking for other sources of authority or for other diversions to obsess over. When the voice of the Lord becomes rare, life can lose focus quickly. And living a direction life can be so draining, it messes with your sense of self-worth and drains you of ambition and hope. These times hit us, like maybe during a time of unemployment and the concurrent task of job hunting. And sometimes people face months, even years, of rejections and dashed hopes and feeling useless and life becomes directionless draining any sense of ambition or hope. And so what are we supposed to do when the word of the Lord is rare? Are we just supposed to generate our own direction? I've heard people say, you can't steer a car if it isn't moving, as if we're supposed to just make something happen and then that will force God to get back in the picture. It's a very me-centered way of existing, this whole making your own fate aspect of our culture. Perhaps instead of just making something happen out of our own sheer will, there are times when we would do better to just simply 
remain quiet, to listen deeper. We convince ourselves that this right here, right now, that I'm aware of, what I can see and what I know about right now, that that's all there is. But even though the word of the Lord may seem like it's rare in this season, even though those who are supposed to speak for the Lord are going blind, as it says in verse 3 of our reading, the lamp of God has not gone out yet. We may give up on God in these times of quiet, but God has not given up on us. The voice still calls. It may be a dark time in our hearts, full of doubt and fear and emptiness, but the voice still calls. That's what our faith tells us, even, even when we're tired of listening to silence. But truth is, we rarely sit quiet, do we? Even when we need to be quiet and listening, we fill our ears with podcasts, TV shows, radio, phone calls, scrolling on the phone, whatever. And we, we stop listening. And if we do hear God, the voice just gets drowned out like part of the cacophony of all the other voices around us. We need to be quiet sometimes, and more and more it takes discipline. It takes a regular practice of quieting ourselves to listen. And when the word of God is rare, it takes even more discipline to be even more quiet and listen deeper it takes practice Samuel was hearing God but he never even thought it might be God clearly it was Eli calling out for him each time crazy old man when Eli finally figures out what's going on he starts to actually finally mentor Samuel Instead of just treating Samuel as someone to do the meaningless tasks, he begins to introduce Samuel to the source of the voice. He names that source Lord. He instructs Samuel, say, speak, Lord. That's what you say. That's the beginning of listening to the voice. And then, Eli says, put yourself into the proper position as God's servant, one who follows, one who obeys, and one who does. Say, your servant is listening, explains Eli. You say, I know who you are, I know who I am, and I want to hear what you have to say. I want to learn. It's a simple instruction for Samuel, and for us, to learn to listen to God. And then, jumping to our gospel reading about Nathaniel. Nathaniel was chilling out under the fig tree, doing his own thing, and he was not in the mood to listen. His ears were full of the voices of the gossip around town, of the common wisdom of the day. He knew who was in and who was out. He could recognize a scam from a mile away. He knew when something was too good to be true. Perhaps he'd been burned too, you know, too many times before. And in any case, he knew nothing good came from Yakima, right? I mean, from Nazareth, right? He knew when something was worth listening to and when it's just a waste of time. So when Philip invites him and gushes over this kid from the boondocks, Nathaniel just rolls his eyes and scoffs. Nathaniel, he's resistant, but yet he goes. He doubted almost completely. There was nothing to this. He was as cynical as you could be, but still he went. Was it because his friend asked him? Probably that was part. But maybe also behind the cynicism, there was still a young man wanting to hear a voice that would speak to his emptiness. Maybe within his closed down exterior, there was enough hope that it motivated him to tag along with Philip, grumbling the whole way to be sure, yet secretly, deeply wanting it all to be true. And when he meets Jesus, Jesus sees him right into Nathaniel's cynicism-cloaked personality and says, Ah, here's an Israelite who tells the truth. And Nathaniel's defenses are up. How would you know this about me? Or in today's language, he might say, You don't know me. And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Which seems like a strange answer to you and me, and it hardly seems to assert any truth that Jesus knows Nathaniel enough to acknowledge him as a truth teller. But something is going on which we don't see, something beyond the written words. It doesn't seem like much from Jesus, but for Nathaniel, <laughs> somehow that leads to a confession of faith, 
teacher. You are the one. God's own son and Israel's king. Why does he make this leap? How does this happen? <laughs> we don't know. Somehow, Nathaniel heard something that he was listening for. He didn't seem to offer himself as Samuel had learned. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And yet he listened. And this exchange with Jesus, it turned his life around. And maybe in all of this is the lesson that we shouldn't make assumptions. When we look around our community, maybe even within our own family, we might think, these folks want nothing to do with us. They don't care about me or what matters to me. They're turned off and cynical. They don't want to belong or to connect. And so we don't bother anymore. But perhaps Samuel and Nathaniel have a different message. Keep engaged. Stay in relationship. Keep speaking and inviting and telling your story. Listen to their story. Keep living God's love out loud in your actions and in your words. Who knows who is really listening? And maybe in all of this, the lesson is that we might think that the other person has nothing much of value to say. But keep engaged. Keep in relationship. Keep listening and conversing. And you never know who is really speaking the words of God into our lives. Friends, go from this place ready to listen for God's voice and to follow the Spirit's lead as we answer the call to build God's beloved community of justice, peace, and flourishing for all in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our world. Go now and be love and light. Amen. Okay, we'll see you all next week. Bye, friends.